Good morning to all of you here, to all of you who may be watching online. We are, we are honored that you have chosen to spend this time, um, these, these precious minutes of your life, you've chosen to spend with us, and, and we are grateful. Uh, but it is, of course, not only, only with us, but we're reminded that, that every breath of our lives is a, a breath that's borrowed from, from the one who makes all things. Gracious God, thank you for being who you are. And thank you for allowing us this opportunity, this time, to come together in your name. Thank you for, for listening to us. Because in the vast universe, it makes no sense to us that, that you could even pay attention. And yet you've invited us, you hear us, you know us, and you, you heal us, you deliver us, you inspire us. You strengthen us. So, Lord, we, we ask all of these things, not, not because we know that, that you're unwilling to do it, but because you are willing and because you do call on us to be your vessels. So may we be your church, not only as we gather here and in prayer and song and thought, but as we continue to be your church wherever we go in the world. As we leave this place, let us still give you all the glory in Jesus name. Amen. All right. Again, thank you for for being among us. Uh, we as we as we gather here, we're we're reminded that that we as Christians it, it is not just our our time spent here, but but followers of Christ are ones involved in a, a daily walk, a, a walk that includes times like this of prayer and, and worship, but also times of, of, of study and learning and service and, and teaching others. And with that in mind, I'm just going to quickly look at the church calendar. It's a reminder that we, we have fellowship this afternoon. Uh, and, we have, and we have lunch in the free store that's going on through the week. Um, and this, this week in particular, we have a, a breakfast together. At, we have reserved a room at Scrambler Marie's. And so we invite you to join us there on Tuesday. And then Friends of Christ is going um, to Tarleton, I believe, um, this Thursday. So uh, we, we meet in the church parking lot and, and go from there. So we invite you to be a part of, of any of those things. Um, I do want to... And, uh, alert you to at least some of some of the the more um, uh, salient names on our prayer list at the moment uh, we um, we will offer prayer for for all of these later and our prayer and our prayer list I don't have one in front of me here but this is a bit more extensive than this but um, but we do want to, want you to remember especially these persons um, families of, of John and, and Joanna who passed recently uh, David is a, a recent addition there, and I also have here for, for Leroy, out of the hospital but needs prayer for strength and breathing. So, um, so I want to be especially mindful uh, as, as, as the service goes on, I uh, want you to be mindful of these. Um, remembering, of course, we also have general prayers for, for, um, for persons all over the world, for for our soldiers and, and others who are in dangerous, who are in harm's way, and, um, and for our nation. And then just a, a couple of things about the, the peculiarities of our service, uh, just if you're, if you're uh, here for the first time. Um, we will, at, at time later, um, we will have a passing of the peace. Um, somebody may try to shake your hand or, or to give you, even give you a hug. And uh, just to forewarn you, that could happen. You're not required. Um, and, um, and we only give you a minute and a half. So you can't get into an extended conversation uh, that's not meant for that. It's to, to uh, remind each other that, that we are so, uh, so honored that you are here. And, um, and, the, and the talking can come later. Um, at the end, uh, for our, our benediction, we will um, we'll invite pe persons to hold hands again. And, uh, and then I, I, I messed this up last week. I, I talked about it at the beginning, but you know, I talk a long time, so, so you all forget everything I say anyway. Uh, 
so by the time we got to the end, well then, um, uh, many persons had forgot that we want to, we want to give it a couple minutes. Um, persons have requested as we, uh, as we are in prayer about the, the future and the direction of our church, where God is leading us, uh, some, some will want to come to the altar. And so uh, there, is hardly a, there is hardly a better sound to my ears than the, than the chatter of people after the worship service uh, sometimes, sometimes goes on to a half hour or so after, you know, after we have finished. Um, I, I love that, but we're asking you to delay that just a couple of minutes uh, for, the, for the sake of persons who, uh, who want to take a little time, a little extra time for prayer. And then finally, um, if you're expecting us to collect an offering during the service, we, we aren't doing that now, but mostly because most of our persons have, have been giving it their online or, um, or by mail since COVID and continue to do that. Uh, but if you did intend to give an offering, we, we won't turn your money away. Uh, we're, we're good about that part anyway. Uh, and, and, uh, and there are baskets that are by the exit doors there. So, so if you intended to give an offering, then, um, then you can leave it there. All right, so, so that's the, the housekeeping part. Um, so now if we, we'll move on to, um, to, to offering our praise to the Lord. I want to say, I, I feel compelled, I guess, to say a couple things about this, about this song. Uh, dwelling in Beulah land. Uh, I, I discovered in, in looking this up, it's not in, it's not in any of our hymnals. Uh, it was written by Austin Miles, uh, coincidentally, uh, uh, 19, 1911, just a couple of years before he wrote uh, another song uh, in the garden. Uh, but I understand that Beulah Land was such a big thing around the 1900s that, that someone told me there are actually 13 hymns that are called Beulah Land. Um, as, as you might imagine, none of them, none of them became um, real big hits. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, not, like, not like Austin Miles later in the garden, which, um, which would have got him a ton of followers or whatever today. Uh, but uh, but it actually comes from a verse in Isaiah. It's the only place it's mentioned where it talks about the land and, and uses the term Beulah. Uh, now, this song really is about looking, uh, it's, it's looking at things from the other side of life. It's sort of imagining what's it, what is it gonna be like when we, when we pass to the other side and we look back at the, at the life that we saw. Um, Beulah itself, the word means married, and I, all my only guess is that somewhere around the early 1900s, while then, people had in mind that marriage and paradise were roughly the same thing. And, um, and, and in, my, in a rare moment of wisdom, I, I'm not going to say anything more about that. <laughs> but, uh, but, that's, but that's the focus here of, of what this song is, and, and, um, and so we invite you to stand and sing along with us.
next song reminds us that the, the promise of, of, of God is something that the, that the ancients knew from, from a long time. And, the, and they would sing this song in Jesus' day for probably more than a thousand years as they would, as they would recount the words of the, of the 42nd Psalm. Realize that every breath that we have is from God. Higher and higher. 
All right. I know it's, it's the moment she's been waiting for, anyway. <laughs> if, as if you would guess. Um, and uh, I, do, um, I do have to confess to, to, the, uh, to all, to, um, especially to the little ones, that, the, that it's going to be a little, you'll be up here a little longer because we're going to have a song that's going to be in the middle of, of what we're doing here. But, but I would invite um, our, our, um, our children and, and whoever else they want to bring up with them to, uh, to come forward at this time. And just come right on up here on stage. And um, we won't go in any particular order, but just um, as whichever one comes to me first <laughs> and so forth. But, um, but to all of you, brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. All of this is God's gift offered to us without price. And so I'm going to present these candidates for baptism. Um, this is Amelia. She's, she's, she's the old one. Um, in, in just a, as soon as this one's old enough to understand, she'll be telling her about when I was young. <laughs> uh, so thank you, Amelia. And, and this one here then is Elena. Uh, she's, she's the young one. <laughs> and, and this one here, Quinn, is... Um, is just a few days shy of a birthday, as you can see, so, so she won't be a zero much longer. <laughs> and we thank you all for Matt and Kaya and, and, and Matt and Tracy for, for, for being here and, and for the rest of you who have, who have come to support them. So now I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask you all some questions. Um, your answers are not up there. Okay. I mean, yes, it, uh, but but you'll have a clue because, like the like the first question is going to be a do you question, so so you might have an idea of how to answer that. Um, but not to not to put words in your mouth. <laughs> so on behalf of the whole church, I ask you: Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? I do. And do you accept the freedom and power that God gives you? To, reject, to resist evil, injustice, oppression, whatever form it presents itself. Okay. And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? Okay. And this one's old. And you do too, yes. <laughs> And, uh, and this is a will you question here. Um, this is where we're going from here. Will you nurture these children in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example, they may be guided to accept God's grace for themselves, to profess their faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? Okay. All right. So there you have it, folks. Now, now, this is part for the congregation, and I do have to give them the answers. <laughs> so, first of all, to, the, to you, do you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? And will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons, that's all of these persons, now before you in your care? And with God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. Okay, so now let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. All right. So, who, who, who goes first? Amelia? All right. Come here, Amelia. You see, we have, we have water here to remind us of, of how God washes us clean. We can't be clean by ourselves. So, Amelia, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And I invite you to lay hands on him. Amelia, the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born through water and the Spirit, you may live as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Your turn, too. <laughs> All right. You want to hold her? All right. Elena, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Put your hands on her. Elena, the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born through water and the Spirit, you may live as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, you like my band. <laughs> oh, she won't let it go now. <laughs> All right. Oh, hello there, Quinn. Yeah, it's water. See? Quinn, I baptize you in the name of the Father and in the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And Quinn, the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born through water and the Spirit, you may live as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, as you said, I'd like you to linger just a little longer as we dedicate this song to you. I'm going to move over there unless, unless you all want us to be heard over the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the living Lord to whom you know. 
Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. We give thanks to God for all that all God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you in, in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Amen. And now as, uh, as I, I'm going to congratulate them, it just seems fitting to, to take this opportunity to stand and offer one another the signs of peace and joy in the name of our Lord Jesus. honor of the giver of every good gift, let us praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Gracious God, how can we say thanks for, for all that you've done? More than, more than we even see, because, because in secret you, you knit us together. Um, in secret you have, you have been protecting us, uh, preparing us throughout our lives for what is to come. And 
And so they're beyond what we even see and know, for which we, we give you all kinds of thanks. And what we can offer, Lord, is, is nothing compared to what you offer. But in the same way, you are, are able to magnify and have magnified the gifts of your people over the centuries. We invite you to magnify these, not for our sake, but for yours. Not so we don't exist here, uh, this church does not exist here for our own sake, Lord, but to serve you. So may all that we offer bring you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. And please be seated. Well, I feel like we've already been to church, right? <laughs> and now, and now, now I'm going to try to get through this scripture. Um, but, but I need to warn you that that it, it's a, that it's going to be a, it's going to end up being a bit of a downer, and there's not much I can do about that. That's that's just the point where we we enter into the ministry of Jesus as we've been following along in, in Mark's gospel. Uh, just a a bit of review that what we have seen through Mark's gospel up to now is we've seen that Jesus has followed a particular blueprint. Uh, first of all, um, for, for reasons that perhaps may not make sense to us, God decides that, that in becoming human and uh, becoming one of us, that he was going to choose uh, not, to, not to be in the spotlight, but in a very backward country among, among poor people. And, and instead of, and while he was going to have many times of, of talking to crowds of people, he really is about reaching people individually. And, um, and, and, and for the most part knew that, that for people's lives to truly be changed, it's not just, not just hearing the words of a crowd, but, but walking a daily kind of walk. So he called people to be followers. They, they literally lived with him. And, and literally followed him around as he, as he traveled. And, and so that was, that was one aspect of, of the blueprint from the beginning. Another was that, that he was really following an outline that had already been written out in scripture. Um, he was very purposeful about that, particularly in regards to the prophets Elijah and Elisha. Um, the, the print may be too small for you to read there, but, but the prophets of old had already done the, the kind of things that Jesus was doing. They, uh, they healed the leper. Uh, they, they revived uh, persons who appeared to be dead, uh, healed someone who was blind, even fed a multitude. And, uh, and so when people saw this, we may, not, we may not be all that aware of that, but these were stories that were ingrained in the people around. And so when they saw Jesus doing these things, it was obvious that he was following the Old Testament. But at the same time, while they were thinking about Jesus as being the, the Messiah, the Christ, the, the deliverer for, for their people, uh, at one point, in fact, we, we talked about that in the last chapter, in chapter 7, where Jesus begins a transition uh, because they have been working around an area that has been that has been primarily Jewish, but, but then he goes outside of that area and they expect him not to do anything, but then he starts doing miracles out there as well. He even feeds another multitude outside of, outside of that area. And so he is trying to impress upon them, and it takes time. They don't get it right away. Um, maybe they're, they're probably still grappling with it, as in the scriptures today, that, that the vision is beyond Israel, that he indeed is, is looking for the transformation of the whole world. That may be obvious to us now when we talk about uh, Jesus dying for the sins of the world, but this was, this was something that was new and, and mind-blowing to them. And one of the ways that he illustrated that was after, after he fed the second multitude, he reminded them that, that the first time, sorry, my, my ear is moving on me, I guess, but um, at the first time that they picked up 12 basketfuls of, of leftover fragments, uh, which, and 12 always, for them, always symbolized Israel. And the second time when he was in a, when he was in a predominantly um, outside of Jerusalem, uh, outside of the Jewish area, then they picked up seven baskets. And seven was a number that they associated with the, the whole world, the seven day of the week, the, um, the entirety of creation. 
And so this was a way that they were, that they were to pick up on this, that, that what Jesus offered to them, uh, he offered to, to all of them, including, including us. So, so that's, where, that's where Jesus has taken them so far. But he still has another shift to make. And I said, this is what's going to make this, this passage a bit of a downer. But uh, before I say that, there is a story that, that we went through a couple weeks ago. Uh, went through kind of, kind of quickly. Uh, but um, but it's, I'm, going to, I'm going to remind you of it just because, just because it has some bearing on, on what happens later. And this was the time where Jesus, again, was outside of the, the area of the, of the Jews. And, um, and he was now doing some healing. They said they brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. And then it said that he took him aside in private, away from the crowd, put his fingers in his ears, and spat and touched his tongue. And the translators don't know like if he actually spat on his tongue or if he spat on his hand or whatever and, and touched his tongue. Whichever, whichever seems more gross to you, it, that's probably what it was. Uh, and, um, and not surprisingly, when Matthew and Luke and John tell the stories of Jesus, they don't include this one. Uh, so, in any case, in any case, then, it says that immediately his ears were open, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. So, that story is going to be um, not so important, except that it's very similar to what's going to happen now. Now, Jesus has spent most of his ministry in, around, in the area called Galilee, and um, and the Sea of Galilee is this lake that's right there. Uh, Galilee area is on the, uh, the left side or the, the west side of the lake. Uh, all the area that's sort of yellowish there is, is area that was, that was mostly Jewish, although there were others that were there. And as I said there, after he had been spending time there, he actually went off over here and over here. And, um, but now he's, back in, now he's back in that area, and he's going to be at Bethsaida, and later he's going to be close to Caesarea Philippi, uh, which, um, which is still mostly Jewish, although the name itself tells you that it was, um, it was named after Philip, who was the ruler of that area, but working under Caesar. So it was, so it was very much being taken over by the Romans. So they came to Bethsaida. So now I'm finally into the scripture, by the way. <laughs> they came to Bethsaida. Some people brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. Now, if you might imagine that, that may seem a rather strange thing to do for, for those healings. We hear about him just healing folks. But, but that would have been probably a walk. And, and you know, with, with a blind person, you don't run. Uh, so this would have been a rather slow walking to, uh, to this place where, where probably no one else is around. And then it says that when he had put saliva in his eye, on, on his eyes, and uh, again, some of your translation might say he spit on his eyes uh, because we're not sure exactly how the saliva got there. Whatever is the more gross way to you is probably the way it happened. Um, and he laid his hands on him. And he asked him, can you see anything? Well, and the man looked up and said, I can see people, but they look like trees walking. Now, evidently, this person had had sight before. He knew what trees were and he knew what people were. So he knew that, that, that what he was seeing wasn't quite right. Uh, and this is the only time we have anywhere in the Bible where, where it seems like a miracle didn't take, or at least only partially took. Uh, and again, Matthew and Luke and, and John, they don't tell the story. So he says, he looks up and he says, I see people, but they look like trees walking. And then Jesus laid his hands on, on his eyes again, and he looked intently, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Everyone in my, in my family is nearsighted, and, uh, and uh, 
And so I, it was just assumed that at some point I would have to have glasses. Although for me, I was, I was late compared to my brothers and sister. They, um, it was fourth grade, I remember, when, when, they, when they told me, I think you need glasses. And I really didn't know what they were talking about. I thought I, thought I saw fine. <laughs> but then I remember being in the, in the, uh, in the optometrist's office and, and when they put the glasses on me and I looked out and I could see the branches of the trees I thought, wow, I can see everything clear now. Uh, but of course, I didn't, I didn't know that I wasn't seeing clearly before. And then, so I wondered to say, well, I see it clearly now, but how clearly do I see it? It's kind of, I, I know that it's more clear than what it was. And, and there's no accident that this, that this uh, that this story comes in where it's at, and, and I don't, and I think Mark understood that as well as he's writing this, that that the process of getting our eyes opened isn't just a one-time thing, right? It's um, we we tend to think it is. We say, I once was blind, but now I see. You say, Oh, I can see clearly now, but the fact is that there's still some things in about this life that we are that we are far from clear about, that we will that will eventually be clear for us later. But some of that can become clearer as, as we ask. So, so here, Jesus is dealing with that with this person here. There's a, it's a two-part healing from, from a partial clarity to, to what we think of as a full clarity. But there's still more to come. Because after this, then, Jesus sent him away to his home saying, Do not even go into the village. Um, and Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi as he's going off to the edge of, of Jewish territory. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, you know, John the Baptist and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the, one of the prophets. Um, this is something that, that we've heard already in John because, because it says that that people were saying back in chapter 6, he said, well, some were saying John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. Uh, others said he's Elijah. And, uh, and others said he's a prophet like one of the prophets of old. Now, I suspect that, that you as, as, as teachers can, can appreciate this because I found when I, was, when I was teaching Sunday school classes that if I asked people like a, a personal question, um, like, you know, what do you think about this? Well, then typically I had people who always gave me every, other people's answers, right? They'd say, well, well, some people say this and some people say that. Sometimes they'd say it that way or else sometimes they would say it, but I'd still, still realize it's kind of like when you, when you have a, a political or religious conversation with a, with a number of people, you may, you may find them answering. Um, you, you can tell that they're just telling you what they've been told. Um, and not necessarily something that they've, that they've absorbed themselves or, or even have a way of, of verifying themselves. Um, so, so Jesus cuts that off from the beginning, right? He just says, he starts off by saying, who do they say that I am? And now, um, and now who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Messiah or the Christ. And he strictly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Now, Mark simply says it this way and says, Jesus says, well, keep quiet about that. Well, why? Maybe because he had never said this in the first place. For one thing, it could get him arrested before, before, he, was, before he was ready. Uh, on the other hand, uh, he's going to tell some more about what this Messiah, this Christ, the, the deliverer that they've been hoping for, what that is really going to mean. Now, Matthew, when he tells the story, he puts a little more detail into it, right? He says, when, when Peter answers, well, then he says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Remember, Simon is his real name. Peter is his nickname. Peter means rock. And so Jesus says, I tell you that you are rock, and on this rock... I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. 
So Matthew, is, it's important for him to include that conversation. But, but Mark simply says, you are, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Because then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Again, that's all, that's all that Mark says. Matthew goes into a little more detail, just saying that Peter said, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. They, um, they didn't catch that thing about the third day being raised. They, they, they got hung up on this idea that he is going to suffer and be killed. Their understanding was that this is that that he that this deliverer is a kind of a military leader. This is somebody who's supposed to overthrow Rome. It's it's going to be dangerous, and some of them, some of them might lose their lives. I mean, you think about the times that they went into battle for the Lord. I mean, not not everyone came out of that alive, even if they even if they won a great victory, and so and so that might happen to them, but not that he would be killed. That that could not happen at all. And there was. And there was never any, any, um, any inkling among, among the Jewish leaders of the, the, and over the centuries that this might happen, even though there's some allusions to it in some places in Scripture. So, so Peter said, no, no, you're, you know, you, you, you may have everything else right, but you got this part wrong. And he dares to say that to him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on the divine things, but on human things. Now, when he says that, he's, he's not calling Peter Satan. He's saying Satan is at, at work here. And, and, I, and I apologize, I meant to put this, the scripture up there, reminder from 2 Timothy that speaks to us about that Satan uh, captivates us in order to do his will. Um, that this idea, what, this idea that, that it was going to be all, all glory and power is from Satan. It's not, on, it's not divine. And then he calls the crowd with his disciples and says to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Now, now you've, if you've been in church for, for much of your life, you've, you've probably heard this statement over and over again about taking up your cross. And, and, um, and no, it's not like, um, like if, you were to ask, if you were to ask Sue, she might say, yes, yeah, this is my cross to bear, you know, the, dealing with Kevin. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, the, the force of that we kind of lose, right? Because, because when, when he's talking to the crowds, that, and remember, he has taught, told his disciples before that he is going to be killed. And, uh, and, and it would be the assumption of them that if he's going to be killed by the Romans, I mean, he could also be killed by, uh, by Jewish leaders or others, but they would have to do that kind of in secret, whether a stoning or a stabbing or something like that. But, but if he's going to be killed by Rome, it's going to be by cross. Uh, that, was, that was their form of execution, at least for non-Roman citizens. For Roman citizens, they, they beheaded them. That was a nice, quick, painless, well, painful, obviously, for a moment, but a quick death. And whereas the cross was a slow, torturous death for the, the ones they considered the scum of the earth. So when he says, take up their, that, that anyone who would become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. It's as if he's saying something like, uh, take the needle with me or, or come to death row with me. That's, that's the way that they would have... That's closer to the way that they would have heard it. Um, and, and I told you this was a downer, right? I mean, this is, this is the way that they're, that they're hearing this. And, um, and, and Matthew and Luke repeat this pretty much, except that, except that Luke says, uh, he adds to this, that we are to take up our cross daily and follow me. 
So what does it mean then to really to, to take up your cross for daily and, and follow? Obviously, we're, we, we can't die every day uh, or, well, in fact, we only get to die once. Once we do that, that's over. But, uh, but to take up one's cross in this sense and denying ourselves is really putting others before us. And I'll, I'll say a word about that in a bit. Uh, those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Now, the, the actual word there that they have for life is soul. And I think that the, the reason that translators struggle with that is because, is because today when we think when we, we talk about soul, for some people that, that word has almost no meaning, or at least it's, it's talking about something about us that, that lives on after death. But, but for them, the soul, uh, the soul, the spirit, the mind, the body, we're all, we're all really interconnected things. And it refers to the whole of life. It's, it's everything that's, that's essentially me. Uh, so, so life is probably the best thing they could come up with here. Um, what would it profit to gain the whole world and, but lose uh, the essential part of who you are? And then he says, those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them, the son of God, the son of man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father with the holy angels. And he said to them, truly, I tell you, there are those, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. And Matthew and Luke also say, the, also say this line, and, and persons have struggled with it ever since because they, because they think, um, and I even had a preacher once say to me that he thought, well, Jesus must have been wrong about this. He thought he was coming sooner. Uh, but, but when we say that the kingdom of God has come with power, Mark has, a very, Mark has his own understanding of what power means. Uh, doesn't mean power in the sense that we do, as we'd assume that this is talking about Jesus in his second coming uh, when, that, when that time comes. Uh, this is also could simply mean the, the power that comes when he rises from the dead. And as I said, Luke also says a similar thing. Uh, and, this, and this is the end of the passage. But let, me, but let me just say another word about this, this idea of, of denying ourselves and taking up our cross. Um, essentially, it, it, to uh, what Jesus is about and what Jesus shows us he's about is that not only is he, is he doing compassionate service to people along the way, but he is, he's going further than that. He's actually putting himself before others. I'd say probably the best example of this would be if, if, you are, if you're a person in the military. Uh, there was a point um, during, my daughter's, uh, during my daughter's tenure when she was, when she was stationed in Hawaii, poor, poor thing, right? Uh, and, uh, and, where, and where there was, beside, they would do, basically they were doing training exercises and then they were going around to different places and picking up trash. And I guess you could say that you could say so. Your job is you're you're picking up trash or whatever. Say well, well actually though, the job is that at any given day, I could I could wake up one morning and say this may be the day that I lay down my life for my country, right? Because at any point, even though they're doing other things, they are in that state of readiness to to lay down their life, and so. And so for me, that's the, that's the closest thing I can come with to the idea of, of taking up your cross daily is to, is to being, in essence, prepared that this might be the day. Um, perhaps in a more, more down-to-earth way, um, I'm reminded of a conversation, and I, I probably shared, I apologize for some of you, I probably shared this before, with a, a woman that I was trying to help and had, had, had her, her children taken away from her and she was, and, and as part of that, she, she, was, she was just living with someone at that point. She wasn't working. She, was, she had a, an alcohol and drug problem. And, um, 
and and she was uh, and you know so so she and she had to get her own place. Uh, so so she had a list of things that she needed to do, and at one point she was just saying to me how frustrated it was because he says they they tell me that I'm not a good mother. They say you know me you know I'm a good mother right I'm I'm a good mother aren't I? And um, and I just said to her today you're not a good mother. Um, they say, well, how can I be a bad mother when I don't even have my, I, I don't even have my kids right with me? And they say, well, but you know, you know what you needed to do today. You, you needed to make some kind of progress toward either getting a job or a house, or you needed not to, not to take that drink that you did or, or miss the class that you were supposed to take. Um, today, you thought of yourself first. You put yourself before your kids. Uh, today, you were not a good mother. Tomorrow, however, you can be a good mother. At any time, you put them before yourself. And, and my suspicion is that for any of us growing up, that if we, um, some, some of us had, had um, parents who were, who, were, who were good most of the time, <laughs> Uh, some of us had, had dysfunctional parents, but, but probably a lot of that dysfunctionality was around those days when they put themselves first. Um, but to take up our cross means that we put others before us. Um, Christians are different than other people, right? Um, Drug lords will care for their own family and they'll make sacrifices for their own children. Um, fanatics will, will, um, will make sacrifices on behalf of their, of their religious group. Um, patriots will, will make sacrifices on behalf of their country. But, but our Lord Jesus has called us to, to love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute us, uh, to take up our cross and follow me. You have that conversation with my, with my daughter sometimes. You say, as, as a Christian, you know, your job is that you're, you're out there, and, and when, especially when she was deployed, that you are now out there laying down your life for people who hate you. But, um, but, that's, what, but that's what our Lord did for us. So this is a witness to the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And, and the one piece that Jesus is going to, because they won't see it clearly at first, is to put the mission and others before his own life. Oh, gracious God, 
how could, how could you do it? You, you made us, you created a universe, and, and at least in this corner of the universe, at least on this planet, at least among these people, we have been a, a disobedient, rebellious people. We have chosen to go our own way and have chosen in the process to, to hurt ourselves and others. We have caused all kinds of pain and suffering over the centuries. And, and if you indeed were chose to just to remove us entirely, no one could argue against your judgment. But instead, you came to us. You walked among us. You touched us individually. You, you reminded us that, that you made a promise from the beginning that you have always been faithful to. You reminded us that the promise was not just for the people that you came to originally, but, but for all of us. And you, you put us before yourself, even when that meant taking an arrest and torture and death. And even then, if we had any, given you any reason to think that we were worthy or, or, or deserving of any of this, uh, that should have sealed it then. But you came back. You came back to us, Lord, and and not only that, you've continued to be present with us. Your spirit is even now in our midst. Your spirit is, is guiding us and, and caring for us and embracing us. And you still have blessings for us yet to come. So what can we say to all of this? We don't have to tell you about our, our sick and our hurting, about Leroy and David and and the others you know better than us what's happening you know what's needed and and you are are the healer and the hope but you won't make us do anything so lord we pray that 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 we that they would allow your healing to happen and not just the people we know we know that there are that there are persons outside these walls who, are, who struggle, who are hungry, who are homeless, who are, who are depressed, who are, are hurting emotionally, physically, who are suffering in places where war is all around them. Some are crying out, no, don't even know anything about you, but they're just crying out for some hope or help. Lord, hear their prayers. And Lord, for, for our nation, for your world. We place it all in your hands. We don't have an answer, Lord. We trust in you. So be our God. We ask all of it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we pray his prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We'd like you to stand for our, for our closing hymn.
it is a, a tremendous price that our Lord that our Lord made a, a price that he paid uh, for us for for you um, it is uh, it is another amazing thing that knowing what the price was uh, he willingly paid it he emptied himself he became one of us he, he suffered as we suffer or, and even worse and and was willing to undergo all of that um, and then came back and is with us now and 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 in a world that is hurting uh, that we we want we want nice quick answers we want people to be to be forced to be good but uh, but he never forced us he doesn't force them what he does instead is he has equipped us to make a difference in the world around us equipped us to be the person that gives them the touch uh, the embrace the love that they need to go forward uh, a reminder that that after the that after the song uh, i'll invite you to uh, those of you who want to, to to pray either at your seats or or from the altar for a couple minutes and uh, and reminder that that god is not finished with us yet but for now when we leave this place we continue to be the church and the grace of our lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit are with you now and will be forever.